Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Excellencies, colleagues, and friends from around the world, welcome to today's event. This panel is being held parallel to this year's UN High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, otherwise known as HLPF. My name is Sheila Smith, and I'm a member of the Society of the Sacred Heart, an international faith-based organization in consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC. I am the UN NGO representative for the Society of the Sacred Heart. Our mission involves the promotion of love and respect for all, especially the most vulnerable. In every place where we are present, we work to achieve our mission in contextual ways through an education that transforms. Our goal, while motivated by spiritual values, is aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We are part of the global community working to achieve a more habitable, sustainable, and just world one that respects the inherent dignity of all humans and indeed all members of Earth community. At this year's HLPF, UN states, along with other stakeholders, including those of us representing civil society, will discuss topics related to the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. As part of the contribution of the Society of the Sacred Hearts delegation to this year's HLPF, we are holding two events. One took place on Monday and this one today. Thank you again very much for coming. <clears throat> I'm grateful to our co-sponsors, the Permanent Observer Mission of the Sovereign Order of Malta to the UN, represented today by Ambassador Paul Bearsford Hill, the Associated Country Women of the World, and the Justice Coalition of Religious, JCOR, who are offering technical support and moderating today. Our moderator is Teresa Blumenstein, <laughs> who is coordinator for the Justice Coalition of Religious, JCOR. Teresa has been supporting the efforts of Catholic congregations of women and men religious to advocate at the United Nations for justice and peace since 2015. She currently coordinates the advocacy collaboration of nearly 200 congregations who are engaged in the Justice Coalition of Religious. Teresa, thank you for moderating today. I now turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Sheila, and thank you to all of you once again for being here with us today. As Sheila said, my name is Teresa Blumenstein, and it is my honor to be your moderator for today's discussion, Dignity at the Heart of the SDGs in a Post-COVID Era. And we'll be spotlighting today in particular perspectives and voices of youth, older persons, refugees, and Indigenous peoples. I thank you for joining us and welcome you once again on behalf of all of our sponsors, including the Permanent Observer Mission of the Sovereign Order of Malta to the United Nations, the Society of the Sacred Heart, the Associated Country Women of the World, and my own organization, the Justice Coalition of Religious. We're able to gather today on the margins of the UN HLPF because in 2015, the world's nations came together and committed to a bold and ambitious agenda that we now know as the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Together, the SDGs represent a vision for a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, the rule of law, justice, equality, and non-discrimination, of respect for race, ethnicity, and cultural diversity, and of equal opportunity, permitting for the full realization of human potential. 
four years after the adoption of the SDGs, of course, we know that COVID-19 swept across the globe and exposed inequalities between and within countries. The virus revealed systems in which health outcomes are tied to economic and social well-being. And it created major obstacles to progress toward each of the sustainable development goals. So today we will hear from individuals living in four of the countries who will be presenting voluntary national reviews this year at the HLPF. Colombia, Japan, Mexico, and Spain. They will present some of the challenges they have faced in achieving the SDGs promise to leave no one behind and to reach the furthest behind first. Importantly, their message is not without hope, so don't leave early. In addition to shining a light on challenges, they will offer their own good practices and suggestions for a sustainable way forward, focusing specifically on SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, SDG 2, zero hunger, SDG 1, ending poverty, and SDG 3, good health and well-being. Before we move to each of our panelists offering those good practices, uh, we will open with the remarks from our esteemed Ambassador Beresford Hill of the Permanent Observer Mission of the Sovereign Order of Malta to the United Nations. And originally from Dublin, Ireland, the ambassador is a distinguished international educator who holds degrees from Oxford and Columbia University in New York. He has enjoyed faculty appointments at both of these institutions and is currently also the Director General of the Mountbatten Institute, a business, in, a business school which specializes in international training and internships. I will now turn the floor over to Ambassador Beresford Hill. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks again to the Society of the Sacred Heart and its United Nations office in organizing this important conversation focusing as it does on dignity, sustainable development, and the perspectives of youth, of older persons, of refugees, and of, in, and of indigenous peoples. We've just heard the, um, in 2015, the UN established the Sustainable Development Goals recognizing the need for progress in 17 essential sectors from economic growth, to social inclusion, environmental protection, the international community helped to construct a blueprint for a brighter future for all inhabitants of our world. <clears throat> in the midst of a ruthless pandemic, which has swept across the planet, demonstrating our interconnectedness as an international community, all of us must heed the direction of these sustainable development goals. As we approach the first quarter of the 21st century, the world has seen the necessity to make major adjustments to, globing, to global living arrangements and to our modes of communication. Changes often highlighted by the pandemic have forced nations to reevaluate their priorities and needs in respect of the SDGs. The UN has identified several key areas of focus for the implementation. The first is known as action at all levels. Member states, international, national organizations, NGOs, and relevant stakeholders must establish a collaborative spirit to develop sustainable development. We've seen in the world a rising tide of nationalism, of xenophobia, bolstered at times and consequent to the COVID pandemic, a trend which threatens the bonds and frays them, the ones we share as global citizens. We must resist the urge to build walls. 
and we must not fall into the false trap of demagoguery. Rather, we must recognize and seize opportunities for growth as a global community. The second focus is in financing public-private partnerships, international aid, domestic financing with a focus on the Sustainable Development Goals. All of these must be aggressively pursued. And this puts burdens on the wealthier nations of the world. But if we are to avoid another Syrian or Yemen tragedy, nations need to work together to provide solutions and not be the source of dissent and conflict. We must also then focus on the growth of technology and science. The stakeholders should try, strive for specific disaggregated data detailing the achievements of the SDGs. They must improve access to technology within their jurisdictions and ensure that reliable information sources promote clean energy, health, and accurate and transparent, not fake, information. And the last focus area is climate change. In the context of sustainable development, the international agreements such as the Paris Climate Accord and the Kyoto Protocol are essential components of developmental success. But still, much more must be done to preserve the ecological framework that sustains us. You, as educators and those who serve the entire community, are the quintessential component of that revitalized future. You are the true agents of the SDGs. Governments may mandate, they may regulate, they may celebrate, but it's the community of educationists who reach out and inspire and vitalize. It is you who give hope to the world. We need to constantly remind ourselves that around 40% of the world's population today is under 25. And we're here today because we all understand the fundamental axiom that education is the cornerstone of society, that quality in access and quality in delivery must be our only objective. Joe Bourne, the Associate Director and Global Chief of Education at UNICEF, reminds us that stronger global education has concrete impacts outside of the classroom. Effective and equitable curriculums ensure decent jobs, more healthy populations, secure states and regions, less fighting, serving the needs of the migrant, the refugee, those who are trafficked into modern slavery, those whose ethnic identity is constantly under threat, and those who are aging and yet who can contribute so much. These are all the communities that are in our purview today, and they must be in our vision every day. In his Global Compact for Education, Pope Francis entreats us to reject the throwaway culture he tells us to embrace cyclical economies. We must echo the voices of youth and the aging and encourage participation of girls and women in education. We must recognize that the family is the pinnacle for learning and provide for the marginalized and the underserved, never forgetting that they deserve even more respect and dignity than the settled and the affluent. We must find new ways to understand the economy so it serves all people, not just the privileged few. And we must safeguard and cultivate our common planet. In the past several years, new obstacles have arisen that complicate our worldview. Artificial intelligence, 
climate change, of course, and one that is all too obvious right now, global public health. To ensure our ability to be well-informed global citizens, we must continually remind ourselves that our obligation is to construct a more equitable environment and create a more prosperous future. An ancient Greek proverb reads that society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they will never know and will never enjoy. You see, with privilege comes responsibility. Knowledge has given all of us the opportunity to build, to rebuild, to heal, to recover, and to aspire to something bigger and better than ourselves. The Christian ethic demands that we keep little for ourselves since all we have is the sum total of what has gone before. Sustainable development can create a new Eden if we can put aside the things that divide us, including our own selfishness, and educate each other in the necessity of sharing and sacrifice so that those who come after us might enjoy the shade which they inherited from our toil. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Ambassador. Uh, and I appreciate the plethora of spiritual imagery and earth imagery that is woven throughout your comments um, as it's a clear underpinning to your approach and your analysis of all of the challenges that we face. Uh, and I also especially appreciate it. I know there are many educators uh, of one kind or another on the call today. Um, and so I appreciate in a special way the call to the community of educators uh, to spread both hope and also to provide concrete tools that will actually make that hope reasonable uh, rather than foolhardy or blind, um, that we all have a very concrete role to play and a lot to contribute um, in addition to on a, a spiritual level, but also on a concrete um, and material level. Thank you so much for your comments. And it sets us up very well uh, to then transition into our other panelists today who also uh, bring an element of spirituality into the work that they do and how they are delivering and making real the sustainable development goals. Uh, and as I begin uh, to introduce our first panelist, I will issue a reminder both to them and myself um, that we'll ask everyone to speak normally, uh, don't rush through your speech uh, for the benefit of our wonderful interpreters that we have working with us today, Anna Blazquez Ubach and Gabriela Scanavino. They will be very appreciative um, if we not rush, but also I ask you um, to keep attention to the time that's allotted for you as well. And with that, I'll introduce our first panelist, Norma Acevedo Olea, who is a member of the Mixtecos, an indigenous people in Mexico, uh, in the Oaxaca portion of Mexico. And she is the general coordinator of the collective Indi Tequio. She studied business administration and has diplomas in human rights and gender equality from UNESCO. And she also works for an NGO that supports children's education in different states of her country. She is the coordinator of support programs. And besides these roles is also part of the social economy network of producers in solidarity. She currently lives in Guadalajara. Norma, you have the floor. Muchísimas gracias. Pues muy buenos días a todos. Para mí es un gusto, un verdadero placer estar con todos ustedes y platicarles un poco del proyecto que ahora represento, que se llama Indetequio. Voy a proseguir a presentar, si me permiten compartir. Mm -hmm. 
Creo que tengo problemas con la, con la presentación, pero, pues bueno, si alguien me pudiera apoyar a, a ponerla, se los agradecería mucho. Mientras les voy platicando, eh, me voy a presentar en Mixteco, soy Mixteca, Yenani Norma Acevedo, Guñal eh, Javi, Dakuni Chindo, y tola yogo que va a chinde. Bueno, pues la traducción literal a esta, a esta frase es: uno solo de nosotros no puede hacer las cosas, mejor todos juntos apoyemos, cooperemos. Y la traducción que puede tener más sentido en el castellano es: Ninguno de nosotros es tan bueno como todos nosotros juntos. Es una frase de Ray Kroc que consideramos va muy afín con lo que queremos dar a conocer en este proyecto. Muchas gracias por su apoyo en la presentación. ¿Le pueden dar la siguiente? Gracias. Pues soy coordinadora eh, de los esfuerzos de cada uno de los integrantes de este proyecto llamado Indetequio, que en mixteco significa estamos trabajando en comunidad. Eh, es un proyecto en donde los nativos, siguiente por favor, que ahora somos 12 personas que formamos parte de él. Tenemos la finalidad de compartir nuestra cultura y de varios pueblos originarios de México. Eh, deseamos continuar fomentando una costumbre que en varias comunidades indígenas del sur de México se llama tequio. El tequio es una forma de organización colaborativa donde todos trabajamos para lograr un objetivo en común que beneficie a la comunidad. Y de esta manera se van creando lazos en las relaciones en la comunidad. En el norte de México también los compañeros raramuris le llaman córima, que una interpretación sería ayuda o compartir en donde, bueno, también se organizan de tal forma que todos contribuyen con lo que pueden. Por ejemplo, para la construcción de una escuela, la pavimentación de una calle, para la siembra, todos van y aportan lo que pueden. En la construcción de una escuela, por ejemplo, los que tienen recursos monetarios contribuyen para la compra del material de construcción, los que no tienen ponen su mano de obra o las mujeres normalmente van esos días y preparan la comida para apoyar a que se logre esa construcción y se beneficie a la comunidad. Consideramos que esto favorece el restablecimiento del equilibrio porque aquí todos aportan con lo que pueden y también son beneficiados todos de estos este, objetivos, estos bienes que se quieren construir. La siguiente, por favor. Bueno, pues gracias a esta cosmovisión ancestral, buscamos nosotros nuestra, nuestro desarrollo personal y también el de nuestras comunidades de origen y fuera de ellas, ya que ahora los que estamos físicamente en, en este proyecto, eh, estamos viviendo en Guadalajara, somos migrantes que, que migramos de Oaxaca a Guadalajara, pero también hay eh, compañeros que viven en sus lugares de origen. 
con esta inquietud de, de lograr esta, um, o de continuar con esta cosmovisión, inauguramos hace ocho años un espacio físico donde eh, promovemos el desarrollo para todas las personas, sobre todo para los indígenas. Unas personas le llaman, nos llaman empresarios, nosotros decidimos llamarnos agentes de desarrollo porque buscamos nuestro desarrollo y el de toda nuestra comunidad, porque para nosotros crecemos y nos desarrollamos todos porque tenemos que hacer posible el desarrollo para todos. La siguiente, por favor. Pues con esta misión, eh, nuestra misión es, somos una comunidad comprometida en la promoción de arte nativo de México y gastronomía oaxaqueña. Buscamos brindar a nuestros comunes, así es como le llamamos a lo que unos les llaman clientes, un espacio multicultural para fomentar la unión desde el conocimiento y aprendizaje de nuestros valores y diversidad. Bueno, la verdad es que es un proyecto muy retador porque buscamos un desarrollo para todos y también de cierta manera erradicar muchos problemas sociales como la discriminación, eh, la desigualdad, y bueno, muchos otros que les voy a ir platicando. Siguiente, por favor. Nuestra visión es ser una comunidad posicionada en favorecer el desarrollo de las comunidades y reconocida por promover el encuentro multicultural que fomente la unión y desarrollo de la persona. En ese proyecto, como se habrán dado cuenta, ponemos a la persona en el centro de todo el proyecto y esto nos facilita mucho la toma de decisiones y queremos también pues realmente crear un impacto a nivel nacional en México para las comunidades indígenas. Siguiente, por favor. Pues nuestros valores son la cooperación, la unión, la solidaridad, el respeto, la diversidad y la honestidad. Estos valores son la base de nuestro actuar diario y son los que nos han ayudado a salir de situaciones difíciles que se nos van presentando, porque con un proyecto de, de, que busca realmente romper muchos paradigmas en la ciudad sobre las personas que somos indígenas, pues tratamos de poner... Eh, nuestros valores y a la persona en el centro de nuestras decisiones diarias. Siguiente, por favor. Bueno, promovemos que los artesanos de nuestros pueblos no se vean orillados a abaratar su trabajo o dejar su lugar de origen por necesidad, ya que en muchas ocasiones los artesanos terminan regalando su arte con tal de llevar alimento a sus hogares como consecuencia del desconocimiento, del regateo también de algunos clientes y luego como no lo ven como una fuente de ingresos deciden migrar a las ciudades grandes y tratan de adaptarse a la forma de vida y en muchas ocasiones van perdiendo su identidad porque los va absorbiendo la vida en la ciudad. Es por eso que nosotros decidimos traer esta, este conocimiento, esta costumbre ancestral a la ciudad. También queremos que, continúe, que continúen los artesanos viendo la creación de su arte como una oportunidad para vivir y así conservar las técnicas. Pues deseamos realmente que se mantengan vivas las técnicas porque sabemos que ellas traen saberes ancestrales y una cosmovisión importante. 
también que los artesanos puedan seguir cultivando y alternar con su arte. Eh, la mayoría de nuestros artesanos también cultivan en sus lugares de origen y lo hacen de una manera tradicional y orgánica, lo que también contribuye a la salud y a la vida. Siguiente, por favor. Bueno, pues trabajamos bajo condiciones de comercio justo en todo el proceso de la cadena de valor. Les damos asesoría a los artesanos para que establezcan precios justos y no suceda lo que les comenté, que terminan casi regalando su producto. Eh, también, como tenemos, damos un servicio de restaurante, eh, les, les damos a nuestros clientes o comunes, como le llamamos, calidad, precio y servicio. Tratamos de ser muy conscientes en todo el proceso que llevamos en el proyecto. Siguiente, por favor. Pues trabajamos aproximadamente 16 pueblos originarios de aproximadamente 12 estados de México con diferentes técnicas. Eh, algo que me gustaría compartir aquí es que a lo mejor ya es de su conocimiento. Los, las comunidades indígenas vemos a nuestra madre tierra, pues como eso, con esa importancia de, de respetarla y de cuidarla. Entonces, toda lo, la materia prima que utilizamos es lo que la Madre Tierra nos da. Y, por ejemplo, los compañeros rarámuris trabajan con pieles de venados que ya están muertos. Eh, nosotros que trabajamos con la palma, eh, la, la sacamos cuando ya está seca. Los que tienen, este, trabajan con barro, agarran la tierra que nos da este, la madre tierra. Siguiente, por favor. Pues nuestros retos, puse unos que consideré este, importantes, la discriminación. Eh, adaptarnos a reglas desconocidas y al cambio y mantenernos vigentes, sobre todo ahora con la pandemia que realmente nos pegó porque también pues brindamos un servicio y tuvimos que parar. Entonces realmente es gracias al apoyo, al corazón de todos los que formamos parte que todavía sigue en pie el proyecto. Siguiente, por favor. Los logros que hemos tenido es hacer comunidad, eh, unificar nuestros valores, porque como saben, eh, somos pues, de diferentes etnias los que estamos físicamente en el proyecto y eh, los que están desde sus comunidades, pues tenemos también diferentes criterios y esto fue un logro que ahora sentimos que hemos logrado. Romper paradigmas tanto de nosotros, de cada uno de los que formamos parte, como de la sociedad que, eh, en la que estamos inmersos. Edificar la percepción de las artesanías, ya que en, aquí en la sociedad por muchas personas no es valorada. Eh, vinculación con otras organizaciones afín que también nos hemos encontrado a lo largo de, del proyecto. Siguiente, por favor. Norma, if I could just ask you to conclude when you, as soon as you can, thank you. Yes. Sí. Termino, termino con esta frase. Promovemos el estilo de vida artesanal, que significa... Vivir con sensibilidad, conciencia y equilibrio para trascender el temporal con flores y cantos. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias a usted, Norma. 
that is truly beautiful work um, and it does not uh, come by accident. I think we see behind your craft, as you say, it's not mere time and effort and skill, but is also a story of a community and a set of cultural values. And in fact, it is an act of cultural survival. Um, and the beauty in the tangible product is, is deep and evident in the end. And I also want to reiterate your beautiful point um, about how the development of the individual and the development of the community depend upon one another and are defined by one another. I think we also see that in the way uh, the interaction between the different sustainable development goals um, and the way that we need to work together to achieve them, um, each one dependent on the other um, and the whole, the whole vision depending on each part. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Our next panelist will be Maria Elena Arteaga who is Colombian and an economist by profession. She has completed studies in women and gender and in agroecology. And for more than 40 years, she has worked to develop social programs with the social pastoral in Colombia, uh, programs with recyclers and micro entrepreneurs. She will reflect today on our theme of dignity at the heart of the SDGs from the perspective of women and the contribution that they make to constructing supportive communities to help overcome hunger in times of pandemic. Maria Elena, you have the floor. Muchas gracias. Eh, para mí, estoy muy agradecida de su invitación y de poder compartir unas pequeñas reflexiones o bueno, o reflexiones que hacemos desde el colectivo Artesanas de la Vida. Artesanas es un grupo eh, al cual se unen muchos otros grupos y con el cual construimos nuestro día, nuestros proyectos, nuestras esperanzas, nuestros sueños. Estamos acompañadas con las religiosas del Sagrado Corazón de Jesús en Colombia, en el sur de Colombia, eh, al, en los límites con Ecuador. Y bueno, muchas gracias a todas estas mujeres que nos comparten su vida. Eh, son unas reflexiones que quiero que compartamos y prácticamente es como rescatar la contribución eh, de la mujer a la construcción de comunidades solidarias que superan el hambre, concretamente el hambre en tiempos de pandemia y claro, el gran paro nacional que aún continúa en Colombia. La siguiente, por favor. Eh, hablar de dignidades de las mujeres es hablar como del día a día. Es como hablar de cada tarea para sobrellevar la vida. Para esto que parece tan repetitivo y cotidiano necesitamos escuchar y mirar cada cosa como una oración. Y voy a repetir esto de la oración para que me regalen al final un momento. Para descubrir la razón profunda de todo lo que hace una mujer para ella, para, los que, para las y los que están a su alrededor, inclusive para la madre tierra. Porque todo lo que hace una mujer, especialmente una mujer campesina en Colombia, tiene el valor supremo del cuidado y es la capacidad de entrega para superar las, eh, todas las situaciones adversas. Eso está lleno de dignidad. La siguiente, por favor. ¿Qué está sucediendo en Colombia? Aquí solamente voy a dar unos datos muy ligeros. Pues bueno, tenemos más de 8 millones de personas que en condición de desplazamiento eh, por el conflicto armado interno y por el narcotráfico viven en las ciudades. ¿no? Eh, la población en condición de pobreza, estamos en el 42.5 en este año 2020 y estamos teniendo un desempleo del 15.9%, bueno, bajó un poquito este año. 
Miles de colombianos, más de 287 mil, comen una sola vez al día y 3.2 millones de familias están comiendo dos veces al día. Pues bueno, en el contexto del paro nacional, más de... Eh, ha habido un maltrato por la fuerza pública, 83 asesinatos, que eso es impresionante, más de 1.677 personas heridas, eh, le, más de 80 con, les han dañado los ojos, bueno, eh, 267 personas defensores de derechos humanos han sido agredidos, eh, hay 106 violencias basadas en género, eh, personas detenidas, denuncias por abuso de poder y agredencia de la vida. Pero también hay pueblos rurales que tienen que en este tiempo han vivido desabastecimiento de alimentos básicos. Pero es increíble, ¿no? Como una comunidad que es potencialmente agropecuaria ha estado sufriendo de necesidades alimenticias y todo a causa de procesos de tratado de libre comercio en donde los alimentos tienen que llegar, ya los huevos no salen del campo, está como al revés, ¿no? Los huevos están llegando al campo. La siguiente. La siguiente, por favor. Bueno, han habido muchas eh, actividades eh, que... Mmm, que prácticamente son iniciativas comunitarias, solidarias para afrontar las condiciones de hambre, ¿no? Miren, en los barrios, en las cuadras, se unían varias familias para poner una sola olla y poder compartir el almuerzo, ¿no? Esto sucedió aquí en el barrio de Lugo, en el barrio Comuneros, aquí en Popayán, en varios barrios de varias ciudades, ¿no? Eh, Varias campesinas se unieron para poder compartir sus alimentos, o sea, intercambiar los alimentos, no se los pagaban, los pagaban con otro producto. Se compartir entre familias y vecinos el poco alimento que se tenía, lo compartían con sus vecinos. ¿no? Algunas eh, integrantes, doña Zoraida de la Comuna 10 en Pasto, tenía que ver si una familia no tenía comida, ella estaba buscando en los gobiernos locales para que le regalen remesa para esas personas. También había, um, si lograban conseguir unos pesos, bueno, cómo le pagaban un trabajo para arreglar jardines, para arreglar calles, trabajo comunitario, pero que se los pagaba, ¿no? Había eh, volver otra vez a los mercados, no las grandes plazas de mercado, no, sino pequeños mercados locales que permitían que se abastecerse de los alimentos básicos. Y claro, con todo esto se desarrollan liderazgos sociales y políticos, ¿no? De todas las mujeres, de, de, de muchas mujeres que, claro, frente a esta necesidad de comida, ¿no? Somos las primeras en saltar en la búsqueda de alimentos. O sea, la indignidad nos llama a responder urgentemente a esta necesidad. Bueno, un ejemplo es la señora que aparece en la fotografía, es doña Teresa Montero. Ella tiene su hijo Julián con, en situación total de discapacidad. Él, él no puede caminar ni nada, tiene 27 años. Ella es una vendedora ambulante. Y ella sale porque, como muchas otras mujeres... Tienen que salir a buscar las condiciones básicas de dignidad humana para poder sobrevivir con su hijo. Una mujer no come sola. Una mujer siempre tiene que alimentarse en comunidad. La siguiente, por favor. Un hecho de realidad. Eh, en la fotografía ustedes ven... Digamos, mujeres con alma de mamá, aún sin serlo biológicamente, con la ética viviente del cuidado, no pasa de ser percibida sin, percibir, sin darse cuenta que no está prendida la olla o la estufa, no está puesta la olla para poder almorzar. Este es un grupo de personas eh, que queda en el pueblo de Santa Leticia, ubicado en el páramo del volcán Puracé, departamento del Cauca. Es una zona rural con productos de clima frío, como la cebolla, las verduras y algo de legumbres. Desde el año 2000, 
Eh, cinco, se crea la asociación Santa Leticia con diez familias y eh, producen trucha, cerdo, pollos, gallinas ponedoras. Y el objetivo principal es abastecer de alimento a los habitantes de su pueblo y las veredas vecinas. En tiempos de pandemia y paro nacional, pues bueno, no tenían todos los alimentos para cuidar sus animales. Sin embargo, lo que conseguían lo compartían con los vecinos para que todos sigan manteniendo sus animales y sus pequeñas tincas. Hicieron lista para la venta de huevos y productos de la granja con el objetivo de beneficiar a todos los niños y que abarque a la mayoría de las familias. Es decir, que nadie se quede sin comida. Las verduras que traen los campesinos de la montaña se comparten y se intercambian, se practica el trueque para que todos se puedan tener alimentos de clima frío y de clima caliente. Pero lo más admirable de esto es que las asesoras y acompañantes son Rosa Elena Cárdenas y María Teresa Caicedo. Ellas pertenecen a la comunidad, a las religiosas del Sagrado Corazón de Jesús en Colombia. Y con tanto amor, ellas dicen, lo que se tiene se comparte y lo que se comparte se multiplica. El, el almuerzo, las aromáticas, las cebollas son para todos los que pasan por su casa. La siguiente, por favor. <coughs> La siguiente, por favor. Y quiero aquí centrar por qué ponemos esta bonita experiencia, ¿no? Porque estas dos mujeres, y claro, las mujeres que están en el grupo, eh, Teresa, bueno, todas las mujeres, Jenny, están dedicadas al cuidado. Con el corazón en la mano construyen nuevas comunidades, economías propias, con el cuidado de cada día el cuidado de estas familias para que siempre tengan alimento, el cuidado del medio ambiente, el cuidado para que se mantenga la organización, eso hay que hacer un trabajo de cada día, el cuidado de cultivar la solidaridad, el cuidado para practicar el respeto, así seamos diferentes, el cuidado desde el corazón, es la filosofía de su vida. Porque quiero resaltar aquí una, una frase de Leonardo Bob que me parece llega, llega con mucho más sentido a esto del cuidado. Porque el cuidado, dice él, es la dimensión más profunda y esencial del ser humano. Es una relación amorosa, es una dimensión de la afectividad. Pero esto, en relación con el medio ambiente, es fundamental y definitivo porque... Dense cuenta que lo que cuidamos dura más, lo que cuidamos subsiste. Y si cuidamos la casa común en que habitamos, pues bueno, solamente así podrá sobrevivir el ser humano. Gracias. Siguiente. María Elena, could I ask you to conclude as soon as possible, please? Gracias. Eh, quiero solamente que visibilizar la, el aporte de la mujer. Mire, el aporte es determinante para el trabajo, para la comunidad y todo esto, sin embargo, es invisibilizado y adicionalmente, eh, en el peor de los casos, matan a las mujeres. El 41% del gasto de los hogares es trabajo de doméstico y cuidado no remunerado, ¿no? Y el 55% en relación con la producción nacional es aporte de este trabajo hecho en el 76% de las mujeres de manera perpleja, 258 feminicidios en mayo de este año y 14 niños y niñas han quedado huérfanos. La siguiente, por favor. La siguiente, por favor. Eh, quiero dejar solamente tres, eh, tres eh, eh, retos, ¿no? Los retos es volver a la pedagogía del cuidado. Volver a la dignidad y los derechos humanos de la mujer, volver al trabajo y respeto de los campesinos y volver otra vez a derechos humanos para todos los ciudadanos. Es una necesidad imperiosa de la sobrevivencia humana. Y para terminar mi oración, por todas las personas que están muriendo por COVID, anoche una hermana mía 
se fue a, a también al cielo y quiero ofrecer esta presentación como una oración por todas las mujeres y mamás que han muerto. Muchas gracias. Gracias, María Elena. And our condolences for the loss of your friend and, and many who faced uh, similar challenges and, and also passed away during the time of this crisis. And you've given us a very clear picture of the true resourcefulness and bottomless strength of women who have chosen to foster and prioritize this pedagogy, this value of care that is complex and binds us to all living creatures, uh, though it involves a great deal of hard work. Uh, thank you so much for put, bringing a light to that effort today. And our next speaker will be Pilar Pavia, who was born in Barcelona, Spain. And she is a member of the Society of the Sacred Heart. She holds degrees in pedagogy and theological studies, a specialization course in political analysis and a master's degree in human rights and migration. She will be reflecting on our theme today with respect to inequalities, SDG 10, particularly uh, from the perspective of migrants and refugees who are a particularly vulnerable group in Spanish society and, and also have a significant presence there. Pilar, you have the floor. Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Uh, muy agradecida a poder compartir con ustedes una de las realidades más difíciles de vivir en, en España. Y eh, la presentación, que hago toda oral, eh, la he puesto en cuatro apartados. Un primero sobre migrantes y refugiados en la sociedad española, 20 años de cambios estructurales. Otro sobre los derechos de las personas como centro de la etapa post-COVID. Una tercera sobre barreras que se ponen aquí al ejercicio de los plenos derechos por parte de los migrantes y solicitantes de asilo. Y una cuarta es poner una buena práctica, una experiencia alternativa de hospitalidad. En cuanto al primer punto, migrantes y refugiados en la sociedad española, 20 años de cambios estructurales y acelerados. Los datos que voy a dar muy brevemente muestran el rápido aumento de la población migrante en la sociedad española desde inicios del siglo XXI. Un número importante de los colectivos migrantes sufren graves problemas de pobreza y desigualdad que dificultan el avance de toda la sociedad española hacia la consecución de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, especialmente el Objetivo 1 y el Objetivo 10. España ha pasado de ser un país de emigrantes a un país de inmigrantes. Datos en base a 1 de enero de 2020 de la fuente de Servicios Jesuitas Migrantes, tenemos de un total de unos 47 millones de personas en la población española, de estos 47 millones, 7 millones son personas extranjeras en situación administrativa regular o legal, lo que supone prácticamente el 15% de la población española. Este porcentaje era tan solo del 2% en 1990 y del 5% en el año 2000. De esta población extranjera hay un 11% que tienen permiso de residencia, o sea, no tienen nacionalidad española. Habría como un 4% con nacionalidad española. Los cinco primeros países en procedencia de migrantes son, en este mismo orden, Marruecos, Rumanía, Colombia, Ecuador y Venezuela. Y también un apartado breve para los llamados migrantes irregulares. Uh, los empadronamientos permiten un cálculo más o menos aproximado de que en España existen alrededor entre 390.000 y 470.000 personas en situación irregular, lo que supone un gran freno al ejercicio de los derechos. 
de estos migrantes, el 55% son mujeres y en su mayoría de procedencia latinoamericana y dedicadas fundamentalmente a la atención doméstica y al cuidado de personas mayores. Los hombres de este colectivo son significativamente más jóvenes que las mujeres. Y en otro dato de otra procedencia, en 2019 en España se contabilizaron 43.000 entradas por la frontera sur procedentes del mayoritariamente del continente africano, pero también asiático, y de estos migrantes un 50% vienen de Marruecos. Otro tema a notar es el gran crecimiento también que ha habido en los últimos años de los solicitantes de asilo. También según datos de servicios jesuitas migrantes, España, en España en 2014 se presentaron 5.947 solicitudes de asilo. Solo cinco años después, en 2019, fueron 118.264 solicitudes. Un gran salto. Los cinco primeros países en este orden en solicitar asilo en España son Venezuela, Colombia, Honduras, Nicaragua y El Salvador. El segundo apartado que voy a hablar, es sobre los derechos de las personas como centro de la etapa post-COVID. El informe que el gobierno español va a presentar la próxima semana en, en este foro manifiesta la intención de dar respuesta a la crisis de la COVID desde las consecuencias humanitarias, sociales, económicas y sanitarias que están sufriendo los grupos más vulnerables y excluidos. Del informe del gobierno español me gustaría destacar dos apartados centrados en los objetivos 1 y 10. El primer apartado, que el gobierno llama Política Palanca 1, y lo titula Prevención y lucha contra la pobreza, desigualdad y exclusión social. Ahí apunta a una modificación del reglamento de la ley de extranjería respecto a menores extranjeros no acompañados y a jóvenes extranjeros extutelados que llegaron al país siendo menores. De momento, eso está en trámite, no está aprobado. También intenta alguna normativa que evite la irregularidad sobrevenida de los extranjeros. En ese punto está dando facilidades ya reales a solicitantes de asilo que, a los que se les ha denegado el asilo, que son muchos. Por otro lado, también se pretende aprobar subvenciones para el desarrollo de los programas en los ámbitos de acogida, integración, atención humanitaria, retorno voluntario de personas migrantes, solicitantes de protección internacional y para la prevención de la xenofobia y el racismo en importante crecimiento últimamente. Por otro lado, también plantea el Gobierno Estrategias para el desarrollo sostenible, lo que llama el reto de país 1, y a, lo titula Acabar con la pobreza y la desigualdad. Expresa en esto la voluntad de afrontar de manera integral situaciones de vulnerabilidad estructural que afectan especialmente y en un porcentaje superior al resto de la población a los colectivos migrantes y solicitantes de asilo. En estos grupos hay un fuerte nivel de empobrecimiento y aumento de la diferencia social y económica respecto a otros colectivos de la sociedad. En estos colectivos hay gravísimos problemas de acceso a la vivienda, llegando muchas veces a situaciones de calle, algunas de ellas muy cronificadas. También la dificultad de acceso al mundo laboral por diversidad de motivos que también nombraré ahora. Y prestaciones sociales insuficientes o prácticamente inexistentes. En el tercer punto quiero hablar de las barreras que existen en el país al ejercicio pleno de los derechos para los colectivos de migrantes y solicitantes de asilo. Hablo de derechos que el resto de la población tiene plenamente concedidos. ¿eh? Uh, diversas praxis uh, que el Gobierno prácticamente no aborda en el informe muy extendidas y enraizadas en las políticas sociales y económicas y fundamentadas en diversas normativas legales, impiden este ejercicio de derechos. Lo centro en tres capítulos. El primero, muy breve, es cada uno, dificultades de acceso a la vivienda. Es un problema que afecta de manera endémica a los más vulnerables. Y 
me gustaría destacar varias dificultades de este apartado para el mundo de migrantes refugiados. Primero, precios de alquiler muy elevados en relación al poder adquisitivo. Imposibilidad de tener un contrato de alquiler legal en caso de situación administrativa irregular o en trámites de regularización. Y, y quizá más importante, un significativo rechazo social, claras manifestaciones de racismo y xenofobia por parte de propietarios particulares a vender alquilar viviendas para determinados colectivos migrantes. Otro capítulo importante es la precariedad laboral. La precariedad e inestabilidad es una de las grandes debilidades del mercado laboral español. Destaco algunas situaciones que afectan a estos colectivos. Una primera, un nivel de paro significativamente por encima de la media nacional, con especial afectación de la población más joven. Una sobre representación en empleos de baja calidad y bajos salarios, aunque sean personas altamente cualificadas. Contratos precarios laborales que imposibilitan el acceso a la regularización administrativa, ya que es una condición imprescindible para ella. Las situaciones administrativas irregulares, al mismo tiempo, favorecen la economía sumergida y la explotación laboral, también por un miedo claro de las personas así contratadas para denunciar la situación que están viviendo. Y otro tema importante y paralizante también es la complejidad de la gestión burocrática en el país, un, por, un problema endémico de la administración española en cualquiera de sus niveles, local, autonómico, central. Es la lentitud y complejidad de sus procesos. Muchos de estos procesos son avalados por la ley de extranjería que tiende a hacer muy difíciles y costosos los momentos de la regularización administrativa. Las personas migrantes solicitantes de asilo sufren especialmente los siguientes aspectos. Largos tiempos de espera para acceder a diferentes recursos, abonos de transporte, viviendas sociales o para determinadas gestiones como las entrevistas de asilo, extranjería, que se pueden demorar más de un año. Luego la complejidad de los procesos, los pasos que hay que dar y la lentitud de la administración para estos temas. Y también todo esto agravado en la época COVID por la brecha digital y el aumento exponencial de las gestiones online. En su informe, el Gobierno se compromete a corregir esta complejidad y sus consecuencias en estos colectivos más vulnerables. Y para acabar, una buena práctica, una experiencia alternativa de la hospitalidad. Desde servicios jesuitas migrantes, se han ido poniendo en marcha. Pilar, ¿puedo pedirte que te concluya lo antes posible? Sorry, thank you. A partir de 2015, sí, 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 ya, en diferentes lugares del territorio español, iniciativas de acogida que favorecen la integración e incorporación a la sociedad de migrantes refugiados en situación de vulnerabilidad. Definimos la funda lo fundamental que durante el año 2019 se han acogido unas 500 personas en esta iniciativa, ¿no? Tiene mucho de acompañamiento, de, de, de cubrir vivienda, de inserción, inserción sociolaboral. Realmente la acabo aquí ya, para no alargarme y dejar tiempo. Es una iniciativa que pone en el centro a la persona, su dignidad y sus plenos derechos. Gracias a todos. Gracias, Pilar. And you have brought into the light today uh, a story of a population in Spain that seems it's largely invisible, not appearing in the national report for the VNR, um, often not included in statistics, not included in housing. Um, so thank you for bringing them and their stories out of the shadows today for us. Our next panelist will be Yasuko Taguchi who is from Japan, and she holds a Master's of Education from Boston College and worked in volunteer service in Uganda in the 1960s before entering the Society of the Sacred Heart. She has a rich experience as an educator of the Sacred Heart, spanning five Sacred Heart schools in Japan. Today, she will present on her educative work with youth concerning critical thinking, global and social awareness, with basic humanitarian ethics. Yasuko, you have the floor.
Unmute yourself, Desupa. I'm very sorry. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, greetings from Hokkaido, Japan. Slide, please. Slide two. As an educator in a Catholic school in Japan, next please, I represent a small percentage of the Japanese educa educators since only about 1% of the population are Christian. Next, please. Along with other Sacred Heart educators, I have been trying to educate students about the realities and truths of global life in the 21st century. Sacred Heart educators aim for transformative education and are concerned with critical thinking, global and social awareness with basic humanitarian ethics all of which seem to be far down on the list of important topics that students are expected to learn in the current Japanese educational system. Next, please. SDGs pledging no one will be left behind resonate with the message of Jesus Christ, who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. To me, SDGs provide a common language for us to communicate the message of Christ to the secular world in Japan. Next, please. The Japanese government has taken seriously the 2030 agenda and the 17 SDGs. Because of this, Japan faces fundamental educational reforms. Next, please. The SDGs project fosters teachers and educators to maximize learning about sustainable society and moving forward towards global citizenship. And this year's volunt vol voluntary national review reflects some of the above, but the attention is only towards Japanese people. If Japan is truly to reinvent itself as a 21st century global leader, not only economically, but also socially and culturally, mutual respect and compassion for our fellow human beings must be at the core of our national education system. Next, please. I would like to highlight two undeserved groups in Japan, people on the move and the indigenous people covering SDG score 10, especially regarding targets two, three, and 10. Japan's voluntary national review does not adequately address SDG STEM, reduced inequalities. This is evidenced by no mention of foreign workers, no indigenous people. Next, please. I'm not going to read all of these, but target two, three, seven are very important to me. Next, please. People on the move. At the Global Compact on Migration Conference in Morocco, where the compact was adopted by the UN, Japan addressed those gathered with these words. Japan welcomes that the United Nations has tackled migration issues and committed to work through adoption of the Global Compact on migration as the first international framework of its kind. We believe the compact demonstrates our will to foster the solidarity of the international community, which is essential to promote safe, orderly, and regular in migration. The address continues with the following recognition by the Japanese government of the work ahead for Japan. We have to work on various issues, such as addressing the root causes of forced displacement, saving the lives of migrants, and managing our national borders. In doing so, Japan will provide, together with emergency assistance, mid to long-term cooperation, as we cherish the concept of human security and wish to enhance humanitarian development and peace nexus. Next, please. 
Japan recognizes its need for laws. Oh, uh, oh sorry. Uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, part of it is not, uh, this is not incomplete. But uh, anyway, I will add it. You know, you can see the students and people, citizens, marching to protest against the, uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, you can see this small words, eh? human rights of the people on the move, protesting against the immigration bill reform that will be stricter for foreigners and refugees. It was dropped this year, but it will come up again. So we really have to be very careful about it. Right. Um, Japan recognizes its needs for laws that account for various instances in which the fo foreigner on Japanese soil must be granted the same basic human rights as Japanese citizens. However, we have a long way to go. While the country is quite generous in providing financial and medical aid to other countries, Japan is particularly guarded when welcoming foreign workers and citizens of less fortunate nations, refugees in particular. Such people have little to no guarantee of protection should they encounter serious trouble in the country. Japan's Ministry of Justice and the Immigration Bureau have been detaining refugees and other foreigners who cannot return to their home countries for long periods of time. We support that the immigration system itself in Japan is being rigorously examined as drastic improvements are needed. We also recommend that the Japanese government tackle programs concerning foreigners who work as technical intern trainees and students and those who come to Japan to apply as refugees. As of now, there are major challenges in implementing appropriate immigration policies and accepting refugees. In particular, we recommend that the Japanese government develop registration, registration for the treatment of refugees, first through a humanitarian lens and not solely from the perspective of legal status, since many foreigners in crisis do not come with proper documentation. Japan's civil society network on SDGs an NGO network for SDGs is planning to release a spotlight report which accurately reflects the above issues. Next, please. The indigenous people. The indigenous people of Hokkaido, Japan, are called the Ainu, which in their language means human. They used to live throughout Northern Japan all the way up to Shakalin in Russia. Now they live mainly in Hokkaido. Ainu people don't have the right to self-determine, nor can they participate in the round table to decide the matters concerning their futures. They have no voice, nor any place in the laws decided by the Japanese government. Because it costs a lot of money to campaign for an election, the Ainu people are unable to represent themselves in the political arena. Both their land and their right to harvest salmon have been taken away, leaving them with little economic recourse. In America, at least some Native Americans receive a certain percentage of salmon fishing profits, as is the case of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. But as Hokkaido was once Ainu land, it is advisable for the Japanese government to pay them a land lease fee. This would be possible if they are paid using profits from public land, such as national parks. Next, please. Upopoi, the National Ainu Museum, is a facility that Ainu people built themselves but that the government has paid money to make a tourist destination. The original Ainu director was demoted to be a regular, regular member of the staff, while a new Japanese director was installed. Next, please. 
The same is true for the Ryukyu people of Okinawa. They have no rights of self-determination. And you can see that they are, both of them are at the edge of Japan. Next, please. Currently, they have a governor who opposes the Henoko, next, please, military base. However, the Japanese government ignores them. Democracy demands that the majority opinion decides policy. Next, please. However, court separation of powers is non-existent in this case. Human rights issues and the result of the Okinawa election are not respected by the Japanese government. There is no place to reflect the voices of the native people of Okinawa. Next, please. In conclusion, we are grateful that the Japanese government supports the 2030 Agenda and the Global Compact on Migration and on Refugees. We are also thankful that our government sees the value in working multilaterally with the international community on issues of migration. We applaud our government for taking a first, but long overdue step to recognize the indigenous peoples of Japan. Next, please. As educators of today's youth, we are willing to collaborate with our government on issues that relate to refugees and indigenous peoples. Therefore, we recommend concretely that, next please, that Japan continue to collaborate with educational institutions and the UN Refugee Agency in turning the Global Compact on Refugees into action. Specifically, specifically Japan could move from being inspired by other countries and funding their projects to taking action ourselves. One best practice that Japan could adopt is the student sponsorship program in Canada, which is one constructive way to build sustainable solutions for refugees through youth-led peer-to-peer education support. This initiative has many educational opportunities for youth who are refugees and for changing attitudes about refugees among the Japanese population. Next, please. That the Japanese government and other stakeholders in Japan enact the recommendations found in reports such as the observations on the state of indigenous human rights in Japan, prepared by the global indigenous organization, Cultural Survivor Fall, the 28th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council Universal Periodic Review, March 2017. So thank you for your kind attention. I'm very grateful, thank you. Thank you very much, Yasuko. Uh, and from the insights you've presented there, I know you bring a great deal of human rights analysis into your work as an educator, which is actually a, a component of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that instruction for, for our young people should not only be provided as a human right, but that should it, it should include orientation as uh, promoters of lifelong promoters of peace, justice, and mutual well being for all people. So, thank you for bringing all that insight into the work that you do. Thank you very much. And our final speaker today is Ms. Magdi de Kock, who is based in South Africa and holds the office of World President of the Associated Country Women of the World. She's held a series of local and national leadership roles in South Africa um, and is a trained teacher who has worked as a school principal, motivational speaker, and has spoken at events around the world. She works to elevate and amplify the voices of rural women globally. Today, Magdi will outline for us the need for governments to understand and prioritize a human rights-based approach 
to global rebuilding in light of COVID-19. Magdi, you have the floor. Good morning to you from a wintry South Africa. Excellency, friends and colleagues, and with all protocols observed, I am pleased and honored to join you today. As we all know, the adoption of the 2030 Agenda and Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 was seen as a great step forward, which built on the lessons learned with the Millennium Development Goals and called for responsible and equitable development and respected fundamental dignity and human rights. The high level political forum has seen states time and time again come forward and highlight what they see as their successes in achieving these goals. In 2019, one member of the G7 made a voluntary national review presentation, which may as well have said, we've done our part. What are you all doing? Time and again, during these gatherings, the role of civil society has been pointed to and acknowledged and then immediately dismissed when the banners are taken down and the hashtags have stopped trending. The reality of our global commitment to human rights and dignity can be appraised far more honestly in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In early 2020, many countries took the sensible step of closing their borders to travelers, but in doing so, too many closed the doors on equality, on the dignity of the individual, and on collective commitment to humanity's right to equitable life. No one would challenge a government for wanting to protect its citizens, but we must also recognize that our commitment to international mechanisms and global citizenship cannot fade when the going gets tough. Indeed, the stronger the global community and the further from poverty, poor health and economic injustice we are, the easier it is for the world to weather the storm as a whole. In the first six months of 2020, it became clear that older people and people of color were suffering the worst from COVID-19's physical impacts. This should not have been a shock. In developed countries, the socioeconomic reality is that people of color suffer worse because they disproportionately live in poorer communities with less access to quality health care. Where vaccine programs exist, minority communities face significant gaps in uptake caused by distrust of a system which does not value their lives equal equally and worsened by unequal access to the internet for booking appointments and uh, assessing educational resources. The cause of these inequalities is systemic injustice and must be addressed at every level of our societies before genuine change and improvement can be secured. In the United States, Black Americans have COVID-related mortality rate, rates significantly higher than all other race and ethnic groups, except for Indigenous people. According to statistics published in March 2021 by APM Research Labs, for every 100,000 Americans of a respective group, 256 Indigenous people and 179 Black people, 176 Pacific Islanders and 147 Latinx have died from the coronavirus, compared to just 150 white people and 96 Asian people. These figures are from the USA. 
but similar shaped statistics exist for most developed nations. Of course, it is hard to calculate the vaccination trends for the developing world, as so many countries and communities are yet to see a realistic program implemented. The COVAX initiative will, in time, ensure that every country has access to vaccines, but I'm afraid it is too little, too late. The death toll, the impact on mental health and devastating economic losses will be too much for smaller developing nations to recover fr from in a meaningful way, and certainly outside of the timeline set by the 2030 Agenda. In developed nations, there is much talk of the impact COVID-19 has had on mental health. It is right that this is discussed. The USA and UK are both in the middle of a mental health crisis which itself has seen thousands of deaths. Women continue to suffer from the so-called shadow pandemic of domestic, domestic violence, perhaps better termed as a parallel pandemic. The terrifying rise in violence against women and children will take a generation to recede to pre-pandemic levels unless there is a genuine commitment to addressing the root causes of gender inequality. Women in communities that struggled financially before COVID and which had faced the worst impacts of, of, of austerity, of, of austerity, that is the word I'm looking for, in terms of reduction and withdrawal of social protection systems are now facing even greater challenges. Women in unpaid or low paid care work in various forms of insecure employment and in agriculture are currently and will continue to suffer from greater financial insecurity. Older people are not only at a higher risk for severe illness and fatality from COVID-19, but are also more vulnerable to the challenges posed by the pandemic impacting their mental well-being and social security. With healthcare systems in crisis in mid-2020, hospital overcrowding led to triage protocols and doctors having to decide which persons would receive life-saving treatment while others were left to succumb to the disease. In general, as older people were seen to have a lower chance of survival and to have lived their lives, they were not prioritized for care. This is not to blame the medical professionals. We, this is not to blame the medical professionals who have globally worked themselves into their own mental and physical health crisis, trying to save people during this pandemic. The chronic underfunding of health care and the constant social injustice that leave older people, women and people of color or indigenous heritage as at-risk groups is to blame. Among ICWW's members, many of whom are older, women in rural communities across 82 countries, the reality is that isolation has become an even greater issue than ever before. We acknowledge that many families have invested time and effort in ensuring they can stay in touch with older or isolated family members during the COVID pandemic. But the lack of digital confidence and literacy means that those users are more likely to be affected by online issues such as malware and viruses and indeed fraudulent scams. The generational divide 
is narrowing, though older women continue to lag behind. They lag behind men when numbers are compared. Older women in rural communities face the same issues that their urban counterparts do, but with significantly greater challenges in addressing them. In my own country, South Africa, we have seen in the past three decades an unprecedented political and social shift. The end of the apartheid era saw the birth of true democracy and the election of an inclusive and representative government under the late Nelson Mandela. Today, whilst Indigenous voices are heard and diverse communities are represented at all levels of the political process, I am also aware that more can be done in terms of social cohesion and collaboration for the greater good. Despite the changes, the historic and socio-economic divides remain a factor and many of the women's organizations and branches in South Africa remain dominated by white or black voices. There is and not... <laughs> yes, I do that. Uh, and it is not that there is not antipathy between these branches, but there is not a great deal of cross-pollination of ideas of collaborative outputs or demands for our government to address structural issues either. So I am concluding to say, our governments must strive for success beyond national borders because no one can claim a moral victory over COVID-19. While some affluent countries are already discussing the rollout of booster shots to their populations, the vast majority of people in developing countries, even frontline health workers, have still not received their first shot. The worst served are low-income nations which have received less than 1% of vaccines administered so far. So when we speak at HLPF, we often think in terms of governments and so civil society, or even governments versus civil society. This is not my intention today. Our calls to action are not combative. They are based in the same commitment to the 2030 agenda that the states of the United Nations have made. So today, I recommit ACWW to amplifying the voices of rural women, of older women, of indigenous women, of young women, and of all those women in non-urban communities who cannot be heard above the din of chaos or the silence of global inaction. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Magdi, uh, for your, first of all, clear critique of the gaps between lived realities and what's described in the voluntary national reviews and also for highlighting this tale of not just two, but many pandemics, um, as the experiences have been very different, um, particularly for people of color, indigenous people, rural people um, who have experienced much higher death tolls and continue to battle a more challenging road in recovery from COVID-19, alongside, of course, the shadow pandemic of rising domestic violence uh, that's been felt by women and girls around the world. Um, so a lot of um, intertwined, um, but complex and differentiated experiences um, that we need to keep in mind as we proceed in our analysis of SDG progress uh, and also in planning our responses. Um, and I'll take as our final word today, uh, just the, the theme you lift up at the end, which is um, that with all of these different realities and these different experiences of the pandemic and of all the challenges that existed before it, uh, we need to take a unified approach, uh, both as peoples who represent many different communities, but also as people who have priorities in different areas 
of the 2030 agenda. Uh, unity is, is a central call for all of us in bringing our many works together and our many takes, many perspectives together uh, to have a unified response, which as the 2030 agenda recognizes, uh, none of the goals are achieved unless all of them are achieved. Um, and none of them are achieved unless they are achieved for every person. So with that, um, I will note, we do not unfortunately have time for interaction questions um, and answers, but if anyone does have a question they would like to submit, I ask you to please type it into the chat box and we will uh, be sure to come back to you with a question. We have your contact information from the registration form. So we will reach out to you um, with a response following today's session. And Sheila, is there any final word you want to add? No, Teresa, thank you very much. I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and the panelists for your very motivating words for our way forward together. Thanks to all and also to our interpreters. Thank you so much.